So some of you may be thinking, red letter romance, really? That doesn't sound like a very macho sermon series title. Amen? You may know that um, I have been outnumbered on the pastoral team. In fact, I'm the only male on the pastoral team. And so this makes for an interesting dynamic as we retreat away in the fall of every year. We go together prayerfully by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We bring together our sermon series ideas and we whiteboard those and we talk about them and we pray over them. Um, and there are numerous times in this year's preaching plan that I was outvoted on what the title of the sermon series would be. Hence, our journey through the Gospel of John is called the Red Letter Romance. Now, guys, whenever we think of the word romance, we're maybe going to like flowers and uh, chocolates and like uh, really bad novels. They're called romance novels. Uh, chick flicks. Romance. Can I get an amen from any of the guys? Is anybody awake this morning? Uh, or is it just me? But then as I began to kind of research the word romance and, and unpackage it a bit, I realized what a fitting term for what we're really going to do as we journey through the Gospel of John together. Because the word romance is to woo and to call into a love affair. And it's our hope that as we journey through the Gospel of John together that you will fall in love with God again. And really, God's Word is a way that He romances us. He woos us. He calls us into relationship. Now, for those of you who may have not have been raised in a Christian tradition, you might be saying, what's this red letter business? What does all that mean? Well, there are, about in the uh, 1800s, a guy had a bright idea, let's put the words of Jesus in red to distinguish them from the black words. And so, if you have a Bible, some of you may have one at home, or with you today, that has red letters there in the place of Jesus. So, those are the words of Jesus uh, that are in the red letters. And the intent here is you look at the Gospel of John, a lot of red in the Gospel of John. These lengthy discourses by Jesus, these teachings. And so as we journey through the Gospel of John, um, we're going to enter into a, a romance uh, with not simply the words about God, but the Bible that introduces us to the one who is the living word, Jesus. Um, and this gospel begins with the powerful statement that the God who created the universe as we know it put on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And I came to tell you this morning, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Grab your Bibles, we're going to need them this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a light up to our path. It is a mirror that shows us who we are. It's a revelation, O oh God, that shows us who you are. So we pray that this would not be simply time of just another church service. But we come humbly seeking an encounter with you. We ask that you would cause these words to burst forth from their hate cage and live and dance in us. We ask the Holy Spirit that you would breathe upon your scriptures and bring them to life in our midst. And that you would give us the strength to not simply be hearers of the word only, but doers also. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and all God's children said. Amen. Amen. So I concluded a preaching tour earlier this week that took me deep in enemy territory. Um, I was in a place called Tuscaloosa, Alabama uh, over the weekend, last weekend, and I did my morning run in my, in my gator shorts and my gator gear. And, I'm running through the streets of Tuscaloosa and I come across this monstrosity of a stadium. Uh, maybe some of you know there's a little football team in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that Crimson Tide, that I happened to run by that stadium. Uh, I was uh, receiving uh, these hateful stares and uh, jeers as I tore through the town uh, running swiftly in my gator shorts. Uh, I think some people were even trying to pick things up and throw them at me. Um, and then the next couple of days, I end up in Georgia, Atlanta, and then in a place called Athens, uh, where there's another little football team. Hey, you go where you got to go for the gospel of Jesus. Okay? And then, and so again, I'm uh, in those same gator shorts running through the streets of Athens, and I come across this other monstrosity. I understand there's some Athenians here with us this morning. Uh, and I'm getting these, uh, these stairs. There's a little team there that plays football. The Georgia Bulldogs, anybody ever heard of them? 
They're, you don't hear much about them in these parts. Um, but again, I'm getting these stares and, and people throwing objects as I'm running. You know, there's a gator on the loose in the streets of Athens, uh, they were saying. And, uh, you know, it only takes one wild one to mess up a whole neighborhood. Can I get an amen? Amen. As we were sharing in Wednesday night Bible study, we were talking about growing up in tight-knit neighborhoods where there was real community, authentic community, where you even trusted other people with your children. Anybody remember those days? Uh, and where people knew everybody knew everybody's business, neighbors actually did things like loan sugar and cut each other's grass. And we talked about growing up in that kind of a community and the love that was shared, something uh, primarily absent from most neighborhoods that we live in today. Uh, then we talked about how it only takes one stranger to disrupt that kind of symbiotic, uh, authentic community in a neighborhood, right? Maybe you were in that kind of a neighborhood. Do you remember that person who moved in who did not cut their grass like everyone else in the neighborhood or did not trim their bushes like everyone else in the neighborhood? Maybe they partied all night long and had all kinds of cars out in the driveway. Maybe you were that neighbor that did that. <laughs> But we all know how that can upset the rhythms of life as usual. And here's this stranger in our midst. We don't know who they are, and they're shaking up the way that we do life together. Well, the Gospel of John begins by telling us we have a new neighbor. And when this neighbor moves into the neighborhood, it changes everything. This neighbor moves in and disrupts the rhythms and the patterns of our sin-broken lives and business as usual. And John begins by telling us that this new neighbor is one called the Word. Now immediately as we enter into the Gospel of John, we can see some major differences between John and those other three Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we call those the synoptic Gospels, which is a big fancy church word to say similar. So when we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see a similar uh, trajectory of teaching, a similar sequence of events of Jesus' life and miracles. We see some places like word for word matching up, like Matthew and Mark and Luke perhaps had an earlier source. One of the disciples perhaps wrote something down and that they borrowed from that. We see a centerpiece of the teaching of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the kingdom of God. A word that's barely mentioned in John's Gospel. And when we get to John, we don't see, as in we see Matthew and Luke, we see birth narratives and stories about Jesus' childhood. None of that is in John. And the central teaching of Jesus in John's Gospel is about belief in Jesus. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are about following Jesus in this reality called the Kingdom of God. John's Gospel is about believing in who Jesus is. In fact, John tells us his agenda in his Gospel. He waits all the way till the end to tell us that I have wrote down these words so that you might believe in the one who is Jesus the Christ and that you might have uh, uh, eternal life in his name. And so John's Gospel is robust theologically. And from the mouth of Jesus himself, we hear these teachings and these words this should uh, shape our life as we learn to bend our lives to the truth of Scripture. And John begins his gospel by telling us, In our kill, in olagas, kai olagas es prastan theon. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Oh, what a way to start a story. Can I get an amen? In the beginning was the Word. Now, that little phrase might sound familiar to you. If we go back and open our Bibles and look at the beginning, what are those first words that we hear? In the beginning, God said, let there be light. So this brings us back to the beginning of the story of humanity. Now, what John does, we can tell that John is a person who's deeply immersed in the Hebrew Scriptures. He lives and breathes and dreams in those Scriptures, but he's also somebody very familiar with Greek philosophy because this term logos actually comes from a Greek philosophical concept about 
first thought of the wisdom that brought everything into being. And so John is kind of borrowing the culture and the ideas of his day, proclaiming the gospel through that lens. Uh, and contrary to what Gary believes, this John is a different John than the John who wrote <laughs> Revelation. That's an inside joke with me and Gary. Uh, but this is a person who perhaps had first-hand experience with Jesus. Perhaps one of the, the disciples of Jesus, or at least someone who was a disciple of the John who was with Jesus. And so he ties together the Hebrew Scriptures, and in the beginning, God said, and he ties together this concept of Logos, this very Greek philosophical concept, into one verse. This verse is power-packed to say that in the beginning, was the Logos, the Word. So that God who spoke creation into existence, somehow this being that we're going to learn about called the Word is one with that God. Genesis tells us in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And by the force and the creative energy of God's Word, there was light. God brings everything that is into being through His own word and will and power. The way that scientists talk about this is that at one time all the universe once existed in one uh, pinpoint, super dense gathering of uh, superheated plasma that would fit on the tip of a pin. And that exploded with a bang. Then we have the universe as we know it. Now the way the Bible tells that same story is that God said, let there be light. And bang, there was light and there was a universe. And what John is saying is that this one, the living word, is part of that bang, that creative energy that God the Father spoke. And God the Ruach, the spirit, uh, the breath of God carried the word. And God the Lagos brings forth everything that we know is reality. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. Without Him, not one thing has come into being. This one who is the living Word, everything that we know and touch and taste and hear and experience of reality was brought into being through the power of this one who's called the living Word. And what has come into being in Him was life. And that life was the light of humanity. He is the light life of the world. One of the images that John is going to return to again and again as we journey through his gospel is that Jesus is life itself. Without Jesus, there is no life. And he is the way and the truth and the life and the entrance into eternal life. And Jesus is the light that illuminates the darkness. In our Wednesday night Bible study, we turned out the lights and we lit a candle and we listened to uh, an interpretation of John 1. And we watched the light uh, penetrate and illuminate the darkness and how it related to the darkness. And what this first prelude, if you will, to John's Gospel is, is actually a song. Um, maybe the first Christians were Methodists because the people called Methodists sing our faith. Can I give them a name? Yeah. Uh, and this song is this rhythmic of creation and a, a testimony to who the Logos is, that probably the first Christians gathered together when imperial persecution was breaking out in caves and basements and homes and banquet halls, and they sang this together. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. He was with God. And the light has shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Oh, I thought more people would say amen there. The light has shone into the world. And the darkness cannot defeat this light. You see, light penetrates and illuminates and exposes reality as it really is. And what John is saying here is up until this point in our humanity, we lived in a place of darkness. Now, yes, we have, as the psalmist tells us, we have the word, the inspired word of God, which is a light unto our path. But think about that like a flashlight or a candlelight at your feet that shows you step by step how to, to walk and to live. But now we've been given a greater revelation. We've been given one who is the light of the world. 
We no longer just simply have words about God. We have the one who's called the living word of God. Amen. This one that John calls the Logos. And this is like the sun shining over the earth, illuminating everything. This is the light that has came into the world to show us who we are, to show us who God is so that we can't get it wrong. Then John talks about John the Baptist, the forerunner who prepares the way. And then he says, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. This light of Jesus has illuminated every human life that ever was or ever will be. Because whether we realize it or not, in a post-Christian context, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and his disciples have irreparably changed the world in which we live in ways that we can't even fathom because we live in the post-Jesus event. But Jesus has changed this world. He's changed every human community. He's changed society in itself through his life, his death, and his resurrection. He's illuminated everyone. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. The very one that created us, and we didn't even know who he was. He came to that which was his own, his own people who were waiting and expecting a, a Messiah. And he came into the world and they did not receive him. But for all who received him, hallelujah, for all who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Amen. See, it doesn't matter who your biological father is, whether they were an absentee father or a good father or a great father. Because through what Jesus has done in his life and death and resurrection, we've been brought into this new family, this big, blended, messy family that we call the church. And we have a new father, our Abba, our God. You know, I don't normally let imperial holidays, like Father's Day, shape our preaching plan, but I think it's fitting to note here that it is right and good to celebrate the gift of fatherhood. Now, I'm 36 years old, and I don't know who my biological father is, and I will probably die and never know. But I know who my heavenly father is. And I know who the Christian men who stepped into my life and shaped and mentored me as spiritual fathers, I know who they are. And so on this Father's Day, yes, we should celebrate joyfully the men that we've called fathers in our lives. But even more so, we should celebrate the one who we've called our Heavenly Father, Amen. the God and King of the universe. And that God has called you his child. He's got your picture in his wallet. You're his favorite. He knows your name. When he looks down on you, he says, that's my precious little girl. That's my son. And he loves you with an incredible love. He loves us so much that in the fullness of time, when we were yet sinners, he comes into the world to put flesh on his love, to move into the neighborhood and to change life as we know it. And that God who created you and formed you with passion and purpose, that God that brought all the universe into existence by his will and word and power, that God has called you his child. Amen. Hallelujah. No matter what your parental caregivers might have been like, it's my hope that you'll come to know the love of this good, good Father, your Creator. Not born of blood and flesh, not born of the will or the act of humanity, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen His glory, the one full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. I love the way Eugene Peterson, in his message paraphrase, says this. And the Word has moved in to the neighborhood. Amen. <laughs> the Word in the Greek there literally has tabernacled among us. The Word has become your next door neighbor. This changes our perspective of God, doesn't it? God is not some God high above and accessible. God is a God who's moved into your neighborhood. God is a God who's moved into your home. God is a God who's moved into the space of your soul by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this God has moved into our neighborhood and he's disrupted the sinful patterns of life without God. This God 
has moved into the neighborhood, and there goes the neighborhood. This God has moved into the neighborhood, and so we can no longer live in darkness anymore. Amen. This God has moved into the neighborhood of our emotional life, and so we can no longer walk around angry and depressed and full of hate, because this God has moved into our life in a powerful and graceful way. This God has moved in and enlightened our mind, so we can no longer walk around darkened in our understanding, as Paul says in Ephesians. This God has moved into our church and into our community. This God has moved into our neighborhood like a crazy Gator fan running through <laughs> Athens, Georgia. This God has moved into our neighborhood and shaken up everything we know as reality, challenged our concepts of God. This God is a God who refuses to be God without us, so he becomes Emmanuel, God with us. This God has moved into our neighborhood by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's called us beloved children, precious saints, my favorites. This God has called you into a relationship with himself. Amen. A romance, a love affair. And this God has called you his precious children. See, when God moves into our neighborhood, it can never be the same. Thank you, Jesus. God doesn't cut the grass like we do. God, this God in Jesus, he hangs out with sinners and tax collectors and they party all night. Yeah. This God that, that we need in Jesus comes in and starts healing the sick and the afflicted and the broken. They can't walk around lame or infirm or wounded anymore because this God that's revealed in the person of Jesus changes everything we know about life and reality and ourselves and God himself. Yes. And this God has moved and to you and to me. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are a community that embodies the love and the grace of this God who shakes up the neighborhood. And we, if it's God's way of incarnation to move into the neighborhood and to change things, then how are we doing as an extension of God as His church? We are called to be the flesh and blood, the body of Christ in the world. Amen? Amen. If we closed our doors tomorrow, would anybody know that Wildwood United Methodist Church wasn't here anymore? Yes. Yes. Are we moving out into our neighborhood in a way that we are impacting our community? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. I asked that question on Wednesday night and immediately start, people started to point and say, Yes, you know what? The people who come to Holly's clothing closet, they would miss us, that we provide clothes that they wouldn't have otherwise. The people who come to our food pantry, the 170 some families that came last week, would miss us if we weren't here anymore because they depend on us for their food. Amen? The people who come to our recovery programs uh, where they can bring their hurts and habits and hang-ups and we become a bastion to our community and a hope that you can get your life transformed, you can find healing. The people who come to our Bible studies, and of course, we who come and gather in this space, we would, we would miss coming together and worshiping together as the people of God. But we are a church that takes incarnation, that takes disrupting the sinful patterns of our community seriously. Amen. We are a church that truly are the church of the wild ones. Because when people see us coming, they say, here come those wild ones, and there goes yes. the neighborhood. Can I get an amen? Yes. There they are, feeding the hungry, and clothing the naked, and caring for the sick, and being with the inmates, and doing all those things that Jesus called us to do, to go out and to be an extension of his love, and his grace, and his mercy, and his power in the world. And what are people saying about you when they see you coming? Have you fit so neatly into the culture and society that you're not disrupting business as usual? Or when they see you coming, do they see the one who they say, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Here comes one of those wild ones, those followers of Jesus, changing everything, everywhere they go. I believe over the course of the next year or two, our church will also grow in the way that we're disrupting the neighborhood through our fresh expressions. And we will literally have dozens of fresh expressions uh, launched from our campus that will continue to be in places like the dog park, disrupting business as usual, the burrito joint, the tattoo parlor, 
in all the other places where we are meeting and being uh, God's love in those communities. And the question I want to leave you with this morning is, how are you involved in God's mission and God's plan to disrupt the neighborhood? Where are you plugged in to a ministry where God is using you to disrupt the sinful patterns of life as we know it? And are you bringing your prayers and your presence or your gifts, your service, your witness in a way that God is using you as a channel and an instrument of His grace and His love in our community? When people see you coming, do they say, there goes the neighborhood? Every time we come to the table, we have an opportunity to not only talk about the incarnation, but to experience it. It's here, gathered at this table, the central act of the people of God that we can do together, that we remember the God who moved into the neighborhood, the God who put on flesh in the person of Jesus. We remember that that Jesus went to the cross, that he was whipped and stripped and mutilated, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But we also come to the table to celebrate joyously as Pentecost people that Jesus is alive, risen from the dead. And that when we come to this table, it's a time to feast upon the living presence of Jesus time to taste God's grace afresh as we gather today. So I pray that you search your own hearts during this time and ask, are there ways that you have missed the mark? Are you walking around in a place of guilt and shame that you need to release? Are there places in your life that are broken that you want to yield to God this morning? And this table is the perfect place to do that. And if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, here's the opportunity. As you tear the bread and dip it in the cup, know that Jesus died for you.